Okay. Um, good morning and good afternoon and greetings and welcome to the Hidden Treasure Series seminar series co-organized by Monash University and the Asia Pacific branch of the Ibn Arabi Society. My name is Devaki and together with my friend Aluan, we will serve as the co-hosts of today's seminar on Ibn Arabi, one of the most influential mystics in world history. This is our fourth meeting and our speaker Jane Carroll is joining us today from California, United States. And just before I introduce Jane, I'll just tell you that next month we'll be having a break due to the New Year holiday and we'll be back to our regular meetings in February 2021. Um, yes, and our distinguished speakers in the new year will include Mohammed Rustin from Canada, Cecilia Twinch from the UK and Samar Akash from Australia. So our speaker today, and we're very, very lucky and privileged to have her, is a senior research fellow at the Ibn Arabi Society and is secretary of the society in the US. <coughs> Excuse me. She first studied the works of Ibn Arabi at the Bashara School in Scotland in the 70s, while concurrently studying at the Architectural Association in London, with a specific interest in traditional geometry and Islamic architecture. She studied under Keith Critchlow and worked with him on projects at the Chartres Cathedral. Jane currently has a design practice in Ohio, California, and it sounds like an amazing place to have um, a design practice. And fitting to her expertise in architecture and mysticism, the title of her talk is The Point of the Compass, Geometry and Ibn Arabi. Thank you so much for joining us, dear Jane, and it's now over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And hello to everybody from wherever you are and whatever time of day it is. <laughs> Greetings from around the world. Um, so I'm going to attempt now to um, share my screen. Which... Might take a moment. Okay, I'm sorry, people. It's not coming up in just oh. No, nope, you'll see. Oh, here we go. Are you seeing that? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. Good. Okay. Right. That's a relief. Um, okay. So, um, just as an extension of the introduction, this is a very similar to um, the talk I gave for MIAS UK. I take my cue from Keith Critchlow, who would give um, repeated lectures showing images to just sort of embed themselves in people, in people looking at him. Uh, my education and my daily practice is in architecture, uh, which necessarily is concerned with how bodies live and move through three-dimensional space in this world. Um, I've had the good fortune, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, to study in some extraordinary great buildings uh, created by people of um, profound insight, which give up a knowledge which is not necessarily accessible intellectually or in words a kind of knowledge which we can call embodied cognition. Uh, that is that what you can take in through the senses, through the sense of space, uh, through eyes, through hearing, 
are giving you um, a certain invitation or a certain provide a kind of opening um, as Stephen Hertenstein was describing a few weeks ago an opening to a, another way of being or um, another orientation in life and of course these great buildings like any work of art um, provide this anything on earth can do this obviously you can fall in love you can be transported by beauty. You can just have a moment at any time. But nonetheless, um, there are these special places. As Ibn Arabi said, someone who does not find any difference in the experience of his heart between the marketplace and the mosque is a person of state, hal, not a person of place. So I'd like to start by saying we have these connections, we have these pattern recognitions as uh, Pablo Benito was describing in his talk, these primordial, primordial pattern recognitions, the most significant being the movements of the sun and the moon across the firmament which human beings from the earliest times we know of have taken note of, have structured their physical environment around, have divided their uh, earth into quadrants according to the movements of the sun through the equinoxes and the solstices. So there's a basic geometry accessible to every human being on earth watching the planets move through the firmament. And I would just like to point out one other extraordinary piece of patterning. This is a photograph of a total solar eclipse of the sun. I know a couple of these have occurred in Australia over the last 20 years or so. There is one happening in Argentina in two weeks time which I was planning to go to witness, um, but COVID interrupted. Um, I have seen them before. It is an extraordinary sight. It is the specific geometry of the sun and the moon and the earth and the alignment connected with the distances between them, which allows the moon in these rare occasions where it passes directly in front of the sun, where you, we on earth can look up and because the moon fits exactly over the sun, you can look directly at it and see these flames coming out. You know yourself in your experience that the sun is a fiery ball and the moon is its reflector. Um, it's an extraordinary symbol and extraordinary thing to witness if you have a chance to do it. So I feel happy for the people in Argentina in the specific line. So what does Ibn Arabi have to say about geometry? Um, he starts with the point. We have been given the point because it is the origin of the existence of the circumference of the circle. Jane Clark spoke about the instant um, in her talk, the moment uh, between past and future, this, this indivisible moment, which is outside time. So the equivalent in space is the point. It is here and not there, but it has no dimension. It takes up no space. but it is the center of everything that emerges from it. So Ibn Arabi says the point is being, al-haq, the space outside, the circumference is non-being, and that which is in between is the possible. The world in its entirety is circular in form, 
within which are then differentiated the forms of all figures, such as quadrature, triplicity, hexad, and so on, indefinitely. So all the possible relationships uh, between entities happen within this circumference of being. Now, whether you think of the point on the macrocosmic level in this universe as something like the Big Bang, out of which everything in our known universe appeared, or whether you think about it on the microscopic level as the human egg from which each of us, each of our bodies emerge, this minute cell less than the diameter of a human hair, um, which if we also go back to what Jane was talking about, the moment, the instant between the past and the future, it also looks towards the future. It is also oriented towards the future. It is oriented towards becoming. So does also the point. So our own origin, our own bodily origin, emerged out of this single cell which divides and then divides again into three-dimensional geometry until it eventually builds this extraordinary um, DNA double helix, which is this strand of quite complicated geometry, uh, which determines our unique characteristics. So we ourselves are geometry. This is the relationship of these energies coming together in particular geometric relationships. And understanding through that where this came from, where this point of, of no dimension um, roots us in the reality of our being. So these are diagrams of Ibn Arabi, um, diagrams which um, Samar Akash would describe as geometry of origination. These are the sort of theoretical um, diagrams, these diagrams in the imagination of how existence comes into being. These are from the Futuhat. Um, this is the divine presence at the center, um, surrounded by the four major names, life, knowledge, will, and power, and then further out emerging the intellect, nature, matter, soul, and then on the outside, the elements, fire, earth, water, and air. Uh, this is a drawing based on another of Ibn Arabi's um, drawings, the diagram of the throne of God and its pedestal with universal matter in the, in the outward circle and universal body, the throne, God's feet, the footstool, the, the, an image of how the world came into being. So the language of geometry um, is something that Ibn Arabi would have known through the Pythagorean tradition as expressed through Ibn Masara in the Andalusian school. So this was brought through through Plato um, who famously said, the knowledge at which geometry aims is knowledge of the eternal and not of anything transient which will decay. The language of geometry is beyond any particular verbal language. It is accessible to everybody of any culture. It follows the same rules no matter what, the same proportional systems emerge on this plane in this world that we live in. So it becomes this eternal, these eternal ideas. And Ibn Arabi brings forth the meanings out of them. Other, other cultures bring out slightly different meanings from it, but it comes from the same basic reality. So we don't know that Ibn Arabi himself was a practicing geometer. He obviously knew about enough to do the drawings that he did. Um, but 
if we start with the practicing geometry and look through the phases that we work through, we have the compass representing the point, the compass needle, the fixed area coming from a dimension outside of the plane, establishing a point. Of course, in this world, um, what Samar Akash would call the geometry of formation, the point is never going to, is actually going to take up space. It's just going to be a representation of a real point which has no dimension. And then the open leg of the compass inscribes the circle. Then if the point of the compass is put on the circumference of one circle and a second circle is drawn, we have the vesica. This shape known as the vesica Pisces, which is um, an, a very important shape in Christianity because it's used to represent Christ, but it is also um, brought out as a very important shape with the Benarabi as this intersection between the human and the world, at the, where the perfect man operates between these two worlds. I don't know if I can read this quote. There we go. Man alone possesses two perfect relationships. By one, he enters into the divine presence, and by the other, he enters into the cosmic presence. Thus he is, as it were, a mediator between the world and the real, bringing together the created and the creator. He is the dividing line between the divine and cosmic presences, as the dividing line between the shadow and sunlight. This is his reality. He has the perfection of both eternity and newness. Now, the wonderful thing that emerges out of these first movements in geometry, this beautiful shape of the circle moving into the perfect image of the circle, is we have the first threeness. This shape is a perf two perfect equilateral triangles, and it brings forth the relationship of one, the number one, to the square root of three. So geometry is in some way a visualization of number. Everything that is profound and extraordinary about number can also be seen in geometry sometimes much more easily. The square root of three is a number which is irrational in arithmetic. Um, you can't, it's never ending, but in geometry, it's perfectly clear to see this relationship of these proportions. And then of course you have the first fourness between the vertical line of the vesica and the horizontal line, you create this fourness and the first square. So these original shapes start emerging out of the point to the circle, to the movement of the circle, to the, to the proportional systems that emerge out of that. And then we have three-dimensional geometry, which um, Ibn Arabi represents through the movement of the point through to the line, the line through to the plane, and the plane through to the cube. So he is talking about what these uh, dimensions come to mean in this three-dimensional world we live in. As far as I know, the only um, shape that Ibn Arabi spoke of in three dimensionals was the cube. The cube is of course, one of the five platonic solids. These extraordinarily wonderful three dimensional shapes, um, each of which, the, the, the nodes of each of which sit within a sphere and the sphere fits directly inside the center of the planes of each of its sides. There are only five. They were first described or discovered by Pythagoras and described by Plato um, and known as the platonic solids. 
it seems obvious that Ibn Arabi would have known of them, but I've not yet come across anything to suggest that he speaks of any of them other than the cube. This is an illustration of how they fit within these spheres. They are magical, extraordinary shapes. Um, and this is how a cube is also intersected with an octahedron. They relate to it, they all relate to each other as well. It is um, an astounding thing that these, these patterns appear. So for Ibn Arabi, he would describe the point as the essence. The line, which has length, but no breadth or depth, is the reality of the angelic plane. It is the reality of a direct um, messages from the divine, which he says, accept no deviation. They come in a direct line from the divine to the earth. The plane, which has uh, length and breadth, but does not have any depth, is the, is the plane of the jinn and the spirits and the world of the imagination. It's the plane on which images appear in the world of the imagination, but they have no substance. And then the cube is this earth and the human realm. It is how reality reveals itself through the levels of being in different dimensions of space. And then of course represented this cube, this um, extraordinary shape of six dimensions with the Kaaba, which for uh, Muslims of course is the center of the world about which everything rotates. Ibn Arabi goes on to talk about the cosmic body of man who fits within these six directions. In his essence, he says, the individual man corresponds to the divine presence. God created him in respect of his figure and his organs with six directions. These were made manifest through him because he is to the world as the point is to the circumference. So the vertical dimension from above is the, is the direct angelic presence coming down to the human being without deviation. From beneath, it's the vegetable world, it's the nourishment from the earth, which is given freely, both of these this vertical dimension are uh, gifts to man. There's nothing you can do not to receive them. They happen anyway. On the horizontal level, this plane of the, of the mythal, this plane of the imagination, we have the interaction with the world, the area where we can be, in a sense, um, uh, wobbly. We can lose our sense of balance. Uh, it forward is vision, behind us is fear, to our left is our weaknesses, to our right is our strengths. This is the world in which we have to find our balance, find our center spot, become established on the vertical plane. This a more modern image, <laughs> the same thing. Um, and just to bring up again that Ibn Arabi goes on to talk about in the chapter of Muhammad, uh, as he describes the ritual prayer, he goes over also these three dimensions. This is how the body moves through space. Um, existence comes from an intelligible movement which transports the world from non-existence to existence. And prayer includes all the movements which are three in number. The vertical movement, when the person praying stands upright, the horizontal movement, when the person praying bows, and the inverted movement, when the person praying prostrates. So 
So what was Ibn Arabi's own experience of geometry? Um, he, at the time of his birth, Andalusia um, had been uh, in Muslim, under Muslim control since the year 711. And in Cordoba, um, there was an extraordinary center of learning from particularly in the 10th century. It was a, the major intellectual center of Europe at the time and studies in geometry, astronomy, uh, the medical arts, all kinds of things were going on there to a extraordinary sophisticated degree. And the geometry that was being developed there um, had been brought there um, from Damascus when the Damascus fell and that had come from Baghdad and they had brought the ancient um, classical works with them. This is the interior of the great mosque of Cordoba, which Ibn Arabi would of course have known well. And this is the stunningly beautiful mihrab, um, which we know from Ibn Arabi's own record that he says he made his final renunciation of the world in front while praying in the mihrab at the age of 19, after seeing his Almohad commander prostrating. He said, if this, the ruler of this land, is so humbly submissive before God, then this world is nothing. And he renounced the world and took up the way. So this mihrab has extraordinary geometry governing it. Um, here you can see the basic shape of the vesica, these two circles. And here you can see the generation of the, uh, the column of the areas of text all around it. Um, this is a generation of triangles and squares. So the root three geometry and the square root of two geometry two very important proportional systems. This is, there is a hidden circle formed by continuing the lines of these 19 beautiful um, floral decorations around the edge of the entrance to the mihrab. Um, if you extend each of those lines down, they meet a point that you can't actually see and create a circle which does not actually um, exist in, in visibility. The number 19 appears over and over again in the mosque at Cordoba. Um, there are various reasons why this might be the case, but number and geometry were both known so well, it certainly would have been deliberate. There are 19 um, arches going into the mosque there are 19 petals around this. Uh, there are 19 segments of the ceiling of the mihrab. 19 is the number of letters in Bismillah Rahman Rahim. It's the number of Wahid. Um, it's the number of the configuration of the solar and lunar calendars, the number of years where they come together. There are maybe many, many other reasons why number by 19 was chosen. And this is an image of the three different circles with three different centers that are either evident or hidden in the entrance to this mihrab. And inside the mihrab is this beautiful ceiling, um, which helps to uh, propel the word of the, the sound of the imam back through the mosque. Again, 19 segments to this shell. And here is the point from which the word emerges, you can say. So the last great building in Moorish culture in Spain was built the Alhambra Palace, the Nasrid dynasty, the palace of the Nasrid dynasty. It was built after Ibn Arabi left Spain, um, mainly built between 1240 and 1350. But we know it was influenced by Ibn Arabi. 
the two viziers of the of the rulers who were most responsible for building the Nazarid palace were Ibn Khatib and Ibn Zamrak, both of whom at periods during their life were exiled to North Africa. They were, and while they were in North Africa in Rabat, they studied under Ibn, Ibn Mazuk, who was a great and close follower of Ibn Arabi. So we know they knew his work well, and they were responsible for these special parts of, of the building. These are courtyards which uh, wind through each other. This is, uh, can't possibly do service to the Alhambra in this very short talk. But just to say for those, and those of you who've been there know this, you go from courtyard to courtyard, not necessarily, not ever in fact in a straight line. It is not a logical progression. It doesn't have a facade. It's not like, for instance, the Taj Mahal, which was another building very influenced by the work of Ibn Arabi, where its geometry is very apparent from the outside. In this one, the geometry is discovered walking through these completely perfect, beautiful courtyards. Um, this is the first one you enter, and then you come through this glorious one, the Court of the Myrtles with the beautiful reflections in the water. This is again how, when geomet with the geometry of origination becomes the geometry of formation. So these ideas of geometry now find their expression in water and plaster and wood and simple, simple materials, but constructed in these glorious proportional systems. It's really made of light and water, this, this palace. Um, this is the this is the famous saying that is is inscribed throughout the palace on the walls. Uh, this is in in honor of a saying that um, the Muhammad made when he came back from a battle, and the people around in Granada were greeting him as a great victor, and he famously said, "Wa galiba illa God is the only victor," and this is repeated throughout. This is the beautiful court of the lions, um, extremely intricate with a central fountain, which opens out into the four streams, the four rivers of paradise. These spaces are, again, invitations. They're invitations to an orientation of your being or a reorientation of your being and perfectly proportioned. This is a small drawing of how the proportions follow the root two, root three, root five proportional systems. And this is the layout of uh, that courtyard, the Court of the Lions and the two lovely areas at both ends. And then throughout, we have these beautiful geometries on the walls, these extraordinarily complex two-dimensional geometries um, in tile work, um, in plaster, different kinds of uh, relationships of numbers. So you get the, this, this has actually got a nine-fold geometry in green there relating to a 12-fold and other geometries just intersecting geometries in light, and then these extraordinary three-dimensional geometries, these pieces of um, sophisticated shapes of plaster, which come down in a kind of honeycomb from the ceiling, this visualization of how light descends into matter, filtering down from a single light in heaven. Uh, this is just an illustration of some of the pieces that uh, go to make up to make up these makarabes. 
And just to linger on just in any, any one of these panels, any one of these panels can be contemplated endlessly. There, there's a quote from um, Ibn Arabi that says, the Gnostics give each thing its due, just as God gives each thing its creation. If you see each of these shapes as having a point of origin, which you cannot see because it has no dimension, but it is what generates the shape. So whether it generates an eightfold shape or a 12 fold shape or a four fold shape, it comes out of this point of origin. And if each point of origin is given its due, if its reality, its essential reality appears with a right with, within the meanings of the names of the name of Huck, its reality is this sense of right. It has a right to appear because it's the truth. So if each is given its due, the interrelationships between the different entities are perfectly in accord, are perfectly in proportion with each other. It is um, a visualization of the notion that there cannot be peace without justice. That once things are given their due, once they're allowed to be recognized as nothing other than images of the representations, manifestations of the truth, that's when true peace appears. Um, and this is the Gnostics vision of the world. And I'll just finish with this image of this beautiful mirador of the Lindaraha um, and the verses of Ibn Samrak, which are around the top of the two windows. Here I breathe fresh breezes. The air is healthy and the zephyr agreeable. I join together all beauties. Surely I'm in this garden and I filled with joy and the pupil of this eye is veritably my Lord. So this building allows for us to um, bring our senses into a kind of order where we are receptive. We are not projecting, we are receptive. We are invited into an opening um, and given information about our true nature. So thank you on that lovely image of the fountain. I will finish. Thank you so much.